Some things change, some things stay the same. Feelings, desires, beliefs, opinions. Some things change, some things stay the same. Rules, laws, control, position. Some things change, some things stay the same. Fame, fortune, fashion, trends. Some things change, some things stay the same. People, problems, relations, friends. Okay, some things change, some things stay the same. Feelings, desires, beliefs, opinions. Some things change, some things stay the same. Rules, laws, control, position. McSorley's occupies the ground floor of a red brick tenement at 15 7th Street, just off Cooper Square, where the Bowery ends. It was opened in 1854 and is the oldest saloon in New York City. In 88 years, it has had four owners, an Irish immigrant, his son, a retired policeman, and his daughter, and all of them have been opposed to change. It is equipped with electricity, but the bar is stubbornly illuminated with a pair of gas lamps, which flicker fitfully and throw shadows on the low, cobwebby ceiling each time someone opens the street door. There is no cash register. Coins are dropped in soup bowls, one for nickels, one for dimes, one for quarters, and one for halves, and bills are kept in a rosewood cash box. It is a drowsy place. The bartenders never make a needless move. The customers nurse their mugs of ale, and the three clocks on the walls have not been in agreement for many years. The clientele is motley. It includes mechanics from the many garages in the neighborhood, salesmen from the restaurant supply houses on Cooper Square, truck drivers from Wanamaker's, interns from Bellevue, students from Cooper Union, and clerks from the row of secondhand bookshops just north of Astor Place. The backbone of the clientele, however, is a rapidly thinning group of crusty old men, predominantly Irish, who have been drinking there since they were youths and now have a proprietary feeling about the place. Some of them have tiny pensions and are alone in the world. They sleep in Bowery hotels and spend practically all their waking hours in McSorley's. A few of these veterans clearly remember John McSorley, the founder, who died in 1910 at the age of 87. They refer to him as Old John, and they like to sit in rickety armchairs around the big belly stove which heats the place, gnaw on the stems of their pipes, and talk about him. Old John had a remarkable passion for memorabilia. For years, he saved the wishbones of Thanksgiving and Christmas turkeys and strung them on a rod connecting the pair of gas lamps over the bar. The dusty bones are invariably the first thing a new customer gets inquisitive about. Not long ago, a Johnny-come-lately annoyed one of the bartenders by remarking, maybe the old boy believed in voodoo. Old John decorated the partition between barroom and backroom with banquet menus, autographs, starfish shells, theater programs, political posters, and worn-down shoes taken off the hoofs of various race and brewery horses. Above the entrance of the back room, he hung a shillelagh and a sign, Be good or be gone. On one wall of the barroom, he placed portraits of horses, steamboats, Tammany bosses, jockeys, actors, singers, and statesmen. Around 1902, he put up a heavy oak frame containing excellent portraits of Lincoln, Garfield, and McKinley, and to the frame he attached a brass title tag reading, They assassinated these good men, the sulking dogs. On the same wall, he hung framed front pages of old newspapers, one from the London Times for June 22nd, 1815, has in its lower right-hand corner a single paragraph on the beginning of the Battle of Waterloo, and another, from the New York Herald of April 15, 1865, has a one-column story on the shooting of Lincoln. He blanketed another wall with lithographs and steel engravings. One depicts Garfield's deathbed. Another is entitled, The Great Fight. It was between Tom Heyer and Yankee Sullivan, both bare-knuckled, at Still Pond Heights, Maryland, in 1849. It was won by Heyer in 16 rounds, and the prize was $10,000. The judges wore top hats. The title tag on another engraving reads, Rescue of Colonel Thomas J. Kelly and Tap- Captain Timothy D.C. by members of the Irish Revolutionary Brotherhood from the English government at Manchester, England, September 18, 1867. A copy of the Emancipation Proclamation is on this wall, so, inevitably, is a facsimile of Lincoln's saloon license. 
An engraving of Washington and his generals hangs next to an engraving of a session of the Great Parliament of Ireland. Eventually, Old John covered practically every square inch of wall space between wainscot and ceiling with pictures and souvenirs. They are still in good condition, although spiders have strung webs across many of them. New customers get up on chairs and spend hours studying them. Some things change, some things stay the same. Hello and welcome back to another episode of NYC Foodways, your weekly food and culture discussion from the cultural capital of the world. My name is John and this week's episode is dedicated to the one-man army, General Subliminal, who so clearly demonstrates that the butterfly was a caterpillar back in the day. Today we're reading the Joseph Mitchell piece titled The Old House at Home, also known as McSorley's Wonderful Saloon. Originally published in The New Yorker in 1940, The Old House at Home is a love letter penned to the legendary New York City drinking establishment, McSorley's Old Ale House on East 7th Street. McSorley's is a remarkable place for a number of reasons, primarily its age. During the time Mitchell wrote about it, nearly 100 years ago, McSorley's was marveled at as a living, breathing dinosaur. Considering the ludicrous speed at which our great economic time wheel spins, today McSorley's should be considered a still modulating primordial ooze era protozoa. To say that McSorley's is set in its ways is to say that the Titanic was a disaster. It refused service to women until 1970 when the city passed an ordinance banning discrimination against women in public places. In 2021, it sports no ATM, no TV, no music, is cash only, there are few windows, the service is well, not exactly rapid, and sawdust inexplicably coats the floor. The only drinks available are your choice of light or dark McSorley's ale. The unique smell Mitchell beautifully describes is still very much present. The smell of a place well-aged, of time compounded, with a thick patina of history. Most critically, McSorley's carries what I would hazard to say is the same feeling it did during the era Mitchell wrote about. The feeling that it has been there forever, which, by New York City standards, it has. When I first started going to McSorley's almost two decades ago, the bartenders had the then strange habit of wearing the flimsiest plastic aprons available, which gave them a bizarre, almost comedic energy. This energy was immediately offset by the fact that they were unfriendly to the point of intimidation, which at the time I found odd, but now look back on as endearing. As Mitchell so eloquently describes in the article, McSorley's as a business was, from its inception, largely an extension of Old John, its initial owner. Distrustful of most, difficult to deal with, loved by a diverse group, unwilling to change, and totally unique in presentation. As Mitchell recounts, the first four proprietors were so set on not changing things, they seemed to be waging a pitched battle against time itself. And to a remarkable degree, they won that battle. Now back to the common era. Not a week goes by without lamentable news regarding a storied NYC business going under. Without a doubt, enough of those beloved spots have been lost to fill 10 dry, ponderous YouTube channels, and NYC Foodways will indeed be returning to some notable losses at a later date. But the New York City dweller's default mindset of perpetual mourning, though comfortable in its own way, is extremely self-limiting. I find it far more constructive and internally rewarding to celebrate the extant old school places we love to the greatest degree possible, as we must acknowledge that at some point they too will be gone. A key lesson from all of this is to not take any beloved establishment or institution for granted, be they historic or modern, as very few will have the durability to become another McSorley's. Haters will say that McSorley's is a tourist trap with big French Quarter energy, and admittedly, nearly all of the patrons I encountered on a recent visit were from out of town. But you can still get two mugs of beer for less than the cost of a pint at most East Village bars. A decent lunch can still be had for $10 or less, and as a brief aside, Mitchell describes McSorley's food as plain, cheap, and well-cooked, the best possible descriptors. There's still sawdust on the floor, and the sad truth is, at some indeterminate point in the future, there will be no McSorley's in operation. We owe it to the greater good to enjoy it while we can. McSorley's, like much of New York, contains multitudes. It is a living museum, a piece of tapestry woven into the neighborhood, a legitimate drinking and eating place, a mecca for visitors, and absolutely one of my favorite places in the city. Joseph Mitchell adored McSorley's, and for good reason. In a city perpetually in churn, it held the line, and in doing so, fermented a culture all its own. And this, to me, is where we find the crux of the narrative. What do we develop when we hold fast to tradition, when we are successful in resisting change? Why is it important to preserve what came before us? And in a city always on the hunt for the next best thing, what is there for those of us who believe that what has been here longest is, by default, the best? New York City may be vanishing, but it is not yet vanished. 
We owe it to ourselves and to each other to hew to the parts of the city we care about as nothing lasts forever. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week for another episode of NYC Foodways. Peace.